Angus Council. Councillors, prior to the commencement of the formal business, I would advise that as chair of this meeting, I have agreed that Councillor Doran can join the meeting remotely and the clerk will advise if she wishes to address the meeting. Also, as members are aware, the special council minute of 23rd December 2022, item 31B, has not been sent to members in line with the required three clear days prior to the meeting. However, in accordance with the provisions of Standing Order 1117, as chair of this meeting, I determine that this minute be submitted for approval as a matter of urgency as the minute requires to be included with volume 183. And a further reminder that remembering that it is one question and one comment as per standing orders as well. Now moving on to apologies for absence. Yes, Provost, there's apologies from Councillor Shepherd. Thank you. Uh, declarations of interest or straight statements of transparency. None. Great. Number three, minutes of council meetings, uh, minutes of um, uh, the A and B are, are the minutes both for approval. Do we approve? Thank you. And minutes of committees, um, pages 11 to 32, uh, minutes C to I for noting. Is that agreed? Thank you. Hybrid meetings update. Um, Andrew Howe will speak on this matter. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Provost, and very good afternoon, members. Um, as you are all aware, we have been progressing with a solution to deliver hybrid council and committee meetings in town and county hall. Uh, we have indicated and hoped it would be operational for the February 2023 council meeting, which is today. Unfortunately, and rather obviously, the solution is not quite ready for today's meeting, and instead we are aiming for it to be operational for the March council meeting on the 16th of March. I'm delighted to update you today that the audiovisual company will begin work on this tomorrow for what we call the first fix. That will be the cabling, etc., and will complete the installation on the 2nd and the 3rd of March, where all the kit will be installed. In addition to that, there'll be joiners, electricians, cleaners on board to align all the required prerequisite work. Once the audiovisual company have handed over the space, there will be time for training for both IT staff, legal and democratic staff, and obviously for yourselves as elected members. I just want you to be assured that this project is a high priority for us and is being managed actively as such. Um, regarding the 2nd of March, the special meeting of Angus Council will be held again here in person in Angus House, and I've had a request that the Special Children and Learning Committee on the same day is also held in person here in Angus House. I can confirm that there'll be no additional cost to this meeting being held in person, and I would ask that members can agree that. Um, thank you, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions? Questions? No. Thank you. Any comments? No. Right. I therefore ask uh, that the, 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 the Council note this update and I also ask the Council to note the position and agree that the Special Children and Learning Committee of 2nd of March 2023 be held in person in Angus House and live streamed at no extra cost to the Council. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Appointments, Knusty Golf Links Management Committee. Councillor Kenny Braze has intimated his resignation from Knusty Golf Links Management Committee. Uh, accordingly, the council is asked to fill this vacancies. Uh, is there any nominations? No? Okay. Um, therefore, I'll ask uh, um, um, Jackie to um, give us further information on this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. It's just to let members know that in terms of the um, appointments to Canusi Golf Links, we're entitled to, as a council to appoint three persons to be directors. Uh, this doesn't mean that there needs to be three directors. It's simply an entitlement. However, if we decide not to reappoint, the risk is that we lose one vote or, at the general meetings and the directors' meetings. Thank you very much. So moving on to number six, um, the 2022-23 General Fund Revenue Budget, and I'm asking uh, uh, Ian Lorimer to speak on this one. Thank you, Ian.
Thank you, Provost. Good afternoon, members. Switch my mouse on here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. The, this is, a, a, I suppose, somewhat a, an unusual report to bring to Council. It's not, it's not the site, uh, sort of report that's been brought in, I think, the 27 years, nearly 27 years that Angus Council ex has existed. It's not seeking any decisions, um, as you, you'll see from the recommendations, but it nevertheless feels um, like an important report to bring um, at this time, particularly with the Council's finances are under great strain and great, great scrutiny and some very difficult options, uh, budget options lie ahead. Um, my thinking in bringing this, this report uh, to, to Council, it's really an intention to hopefully in, inform uh, to generate some discussion and debate uh, within the chamber and and perhaps out with in terms of uh, you know the council staff and and the general public. Uh, I also intended through the through the report to show how difficult it's going to be to make the the financial savings on the scale that we we think is going to be required over the next few years. And my other objective in doing it is is to try and make the council's financial information a little bit more relatable, hopefully, um, for yourselves as councillors. I'm conscious there's quite a number of new councillors, um, uh, as well as the public and and obviously our staff. Now I've tried to keep the analysis, believe it or not, I've tried to keep the analysis um, as high level and as as relatively um, simple as I can, but while still being informative. In practice, our, our, our finances are, are, are pretty complex. Um, and you can get into all sorts of uh, uh, complexities around you know, gross budgets, net budgets, and all of that sort of thing. So I've tried as far as I can to steer away from that and, and present it as, as, uh, as, as reasonably simply as I can. You can let me know whether I've succeeded in that once, uh, once I've finished introducing the report. The report is based on our budget for the current financial year, so 22-3 uh, financial year. Um, we're about a month or so away from setting the 23-24 budget and some of the lines that are in this report today will look different in, in, in terms of 23-24. So for example, energy costs in the current year, they'll be a lot higher in next year's budget. So there's, there's a few things like that to, to, uh, to, to be aware of. Um, the, there's a lot of things that can be drawn, I suppose, from the analysis in, in this report. But you'll see from the report that the single biggest area of our, our expenditure is the funding that the council provides to the, the uh, for adult social care uh, services, which are provided through uh, the Angus Health and Social Care Partnership. So at 65 and a half million pounds, that's 21% of the council's entire uh, entire net budget. So that's a significant part of it. Our next biggest area of, of expenditure is in uh, teaching staff costs. And if, if you bring together uh, primary, secondary, additional support needs teachers, Together, they make up 23% of the budget, and that's another 71 million uh, in total. But I also want to flag three other areas of significant uh, spend. Um, again, you'll see from the report, PPP, PFI contract uh, payments for uh, some of our schools that have been built through that, that model of, of delivery, as well as the A92 dual carriageway, they now amount to uh, uh, just over 19 million uh, each year. So that's 6% of the entire budget. Now, those are unavoidable costs. Those are contracts, long-term contracts we're, uh, we're, 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 we're locked into. Um, and those rise each year with inflation. Uh, unfortunately, they rise with uh, RPI inflation. So that's a, that's a big problem with RPI being so high. Uh, the next area to flag, uh, and this is split into two, uh, two parts within the table uh, in the report, uh, in the main body of the report is loan repayments and loan interest costs. So that's the cost of uh, borrowing that we've undertaken to fund capital projects. We need to repay that borrowing and we also need to pay the interest on, on those loans. Combined, that's nearly another 11 million pounds, three and a half percent of the budget. Those costs, again, they're not entirely fixed, but they're largely unavoidable because of commitments that have previously been made. And then the last big one I would, I would specifically highlight is uh, incineration costs. So this is, the, this is the waste that goes in, in Angus in the purple bin. So that costs nearly £6 million uh, a year to process. That's, that's roughly 2% of the council's entire budget. So it's a big cost. Um, and it probably costs somewhere around six times as much to dispose of non-recycled waste as it does to deal with uh, recycled materials. And that's one reason, along with obviously the environmental impact, uh, why recycling is, is so important um, because it's because it's so expensive so I've just mentioned there are five things just five um, adult social care teachers PPP payments loans cost and the purple bin waste 
Together, those things are 55% of the council's entire budget. So you can see that only a small number of things make up a, a, a substantial part of the budget. Now, section six of the report, I'm making some uh, observations on the analysis, which I think are, are important to have in mind as we come to the, the, the budget setting meeting for financial year 23-24. As has been well trailed now, the, the council faces a significant funding shortfall uh, into over the next three years. Uh, our, our estimate of that is 52 million. I actually think that will be a little bit more than that, unfortunately. Uh, but I'll bring those details on the 2nd of March. Now, even if we've got council tax increases to help to take away some of that gap, potentially use of council reserves, options to generate additional income, uh, the reality is that the bulk of that funding gap, perhaps maybe 30 to 35 million of that gap, will need to come from cuts in expenditure. Now, cuts of that scale, on top of the 78 million that has already been taken out of the council's budget in the last decade, that's we can't make that level of, of reduction by small changes and efficiencies alone. Um, that level of saving on top of what's already been done uh, does require, and it's also the period, it's a really short period to try and achieve that level of saving. Um, that will require widespread, widespread change um, and reduction in, in, in the, 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 council, the services the council provides. Now, bearing in mind what I've said about more than half the budget is spent in a relatively small number area of areas, it's, it's probably not difficult to see why uh, at Scrutiny and Audit Committee uh, last week um, when the committee was looking at our corporate risk register, we were saying that the financial sustainability risk uh, is at the highest level it's, uh, it's ever been. The report today also makes mention of what I call a, a growing mismatch between the, the funding the council has and the duties and expectations placed upon it. So it's not as simple as just cutting staff and cutting services to, to make expenditure fit with the funding we have. It's not as, it's not as easy as that. If, if, if that was the case, it would be fine. We cannot simply stop providing uh, services because by law we've got to provide them. Um, so it might be, for example, desirable from a budget point of view, in terms of balancing the budget to say, right, we're, we're going to stop gritting roads, or we're going to stop providing school transport. I could pick any number of examples. But we can't do that because we'd be in breach of our statutory duties and in effect as a council we'd be breaking the law. Um, so trying to square the circle of reducing our expenditure to balance our budget, which is a legal requirement, whilst keeping all of the other legal duties still, still, still going is, is, is the massive challenge. Now of course we know there's only so much money to go around for, for public uh, services. In reality there's probably never enough, you can always do more. Um, but the main concern, and why I'm, I'm referring to this mismatch issue, um, is, is really just trying to get that. The, 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 there is a growing mismatch, as I say in the report, between the duties we have to comply with and the money that we have, um, and trying to keep that, trying to make that work over the next two to three years. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's achievable, if I'm, if I'm entirely honest. Um, and that's why I think there needs to be a a discussion about if there is only so much money to go around, um, then the, you know, we, we have to have a look at the duties and responsibilities of, of councils. That's a national discussion that needs to happen. That's not something locally that, that Angus Council can deal with. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope the report has been of interest. It will be of some help as we move into the 23-24 budget setting uh, process. Um, as I say, it's not something, it's, not, it's an unusual report in many ways, but I, I, I hope it has been uh, informative and, and in some ways useful. So thank you, Provost. Happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, that, Ian Lormer. Um, do we have any questions of Ian? Councillor Cheap, I saw his hand first. Any other questions? Councillor Gall. Any further questions? Uh, Councillor Wan. Any further questions? Anything from Councillor Doran, or is she? No. Okay. Thank you, um, Councillor Cheap. Yeah, thanks, Provost. Um, it means a pretty simple one, um, Ian. The, the um, item is just for clarity because it's a public document, and and to, and I, I do think it makes good, interesting reading and really interesting reading for people out with council. So thanks for that. The item that uh, table one was just <coughs> for clarity and to give an example on 
the items shown as grants shown as income in other service areas. Could bearing in mind it's fifteen million, could you just give us the example of the main principal part of that, please? Yeah, th thanks, Councillor Cheap. Uh, y yes, so that one is a, I guess, a quirk of how we present the budget. Uh, so in the in the, the and I was trying always with this uh, this report to relate it back to our, our, our published uh, budget uh, uh, volume. So within that within that presentation, there are a number of areas of expenditure that are funded uh, through what are called specific grants, and those are ring fence grants for specific purposes. The biggest one is early years learning, uh, early learning and childcare uh, grant. So what we show in the budget volume in calculating the net budget is that income sits within those service areas. But when we um, present the budget as a summary, we, we, we credit that back up above the line because it's already in the, in the grant number. It, it is a bit complex and a bit technical, but it's, it's really a, a, a funding stream um, and it's how we've presented it in the, in, in the budget. But the largest area is uh, early learning and childcare, um, which is funded uh, significantly by a uh, specific grant. Uh, I'm going to go on to Councillor Gall in a minute, but can I remind members to switch off their laptop volumes, please, if everyone can maybe have a look and make sure their volumes are down on that. Thank you very much. Uh, with that in mind, I'll now uh, ask Councillor Ian Gall his question. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, thank you, Mr Ormer, and thank you for the report. It was uh, very insight insightful of how precarious the Angus Council's position is. Um, we've seen £78 million of cuts in the last 10 years. We're in year one of three of the next £52 million pounds of um, cuts. Um, is year three possible if things don't change with regards to settlements from the Scottish Government in this current situation? Thank you, Councillor Gall. I suppose the honest truth is I, I don't know. We are uh, planning on bringing a, a three-year budget um, proposal to, to the meeting on the 2nd of March. That will give an indication of, of just how close or how far away we are from been able to make it work over that over that three year uh, three year period, that depends on many decisions around, for example, council tax increases and a whole load of other uh, other um, uh, options, use of council reserves. So there's a number of different components that would go into that. Um, I, I, the, the point I'm really trying to make in all of this is that um, having already taken out that level of saving, the prospect of making that further level of saving on such a significant scale and being able to continue to, pr to fulfil all of the council's statutory duties. I, 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 I worry about our ability to, to, to be able to, to do that. Now, of course, it's our job as, as, as officers and working with elected members to, to, to try and make that work. But um, I think I'm saying it's, it, it's the hardest I can ever, ever uh, imagine it. And I don't know, over my career, I've probably delivered 30 budgets, maybe, maybe slightly more. So I've, this is not my first rodeo. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've got a lot of experience in this, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's extremely, extremely challenging, um, as you will see when the budget reports come forward in two or three weeks' time. Councillor Wan. Thank you, Provost. Uh, my question, it comes back to the, the, the teacher's pay dispute that's that's ongoing at the moment, but <coughs> you're, you're showing the figures Councillor Wan, we're not picking you up. I don't know why we're not oh. picking you up. It's, it's just That's yeah. better, maybe, is it? Thank you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Certainly on anyway. It's a, it's a teacher's pay dispute and you know, you're obviously showing here teaching staff wages and such things already on this sheet is, is, is a fair percentage of our, our budget. Is there any cognizance that if the teacher's dispute is sorted out that this will be backdated and does that figure reflect that? Yeah, th thanks Councillor Wan. Y yeah, th so the, because of the timing of this report coming forward and not all of the, pay, the staff pay deals for, for financial year 22-23 haven't been settled, the, the teachers dispute, as you, as you say, is, is still ongoing. We've actually still got within the, within the analysis, and um, it's actually item 9, item 9 on, on table 1, provision for staff pay increases. That ultimately, once all the deals are settled, will be will be burst out to all the different services, and that would include uh, teachers. So, for example, items two and three on on that same table, the values there for teaching staff costs will go up once the pay uh, award has been has been allocated. So, um, that's just a quirk of where we are in terms of those arrangements and, and the deals not having quite been been settled yet. Okay, so 
and just to clarify then, what percentage has been used to do your adjustments for teachers' pay settlement? Is it the five or whatever was maybe originally agreed, or because obviously yeah. it's looking as though it may increase? Yeah. So what what we've assumed. Uh, <coughs> so there was a report to council in December, I think it was, wasn't it, uh, that set out the detail on the on on the pay deal. So we we at that time assumed that the cost of that uh, pay deal would be in line with the latest offer. Now that offer was, um, for uh, I think it was 6.85% for the, those teachers at the, the lowest grades, but 5% for those above, above, a certain, uh, above a certain level. However, however, you might remember from that report that we don't have enough money in our budget, our core budget, to fund all of those pay deals. So there was a need to draw down from the council's reserves which aren't shown in this, uh, in this analysis, um, in order to make that work. So the cost of pay, uh, even if it was even even if it was settled on what what's been the latest offer, would be more than what we have in that, that that the numbers here, because some of that funding is going to have to come from reserves in the current year and then be found on an ongoing basis into next year. Uh, anyone got any comments? Uh, Councillor Duff, I saw your hand first, sorry, hold on. Uh, yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, 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 I'm going to write them all down, Councillor Duff. Everyone else gets the same, same chance. Uh, Councillor Wan? Oh, no, Councillor Gall. Councillor Gall, two, Councillor Gall. Any? Uh, Councillor Fairweather. Um, uh, Councillor Whiteside was next, thank you. And Councillor Braze is five. Right, okay, Councillor Duff. Thanks, Provost. Yeah, I mean, I'll keep it pretty brief. Um, I think it's a very interesting, very useful report. Um, I mean, I, I picked up one or two things that I asked questions about when I saw it, and it's just looking at the finances through a, a different prism, I guess, and, and I, th I thought it was a very useful, interesting report, and uh, would like to thank Mr Lorimer for producing it. Councillor Goal. Uh, thank you. Since 2013, councils have seen a real terms 4.2% cut to their budgets, yet more and more statutory requirements set by the Scottish Government without the adequate funding to match. But when it comes to spending, the SNP-wide Scottish Government aren't shy when it suits them. A handful of examples are two Carmack ferries, five years wait, windows painted on to make them look more complete and more than £70 million over budget. £43 million spent on Presswood Airport that's still yet to find a buyer. £52 million on a failed bifab bailout, and a little bit closer to home, 17 Council million. Goal, what's this relevant to our budgets or our Angus Council? That we need, uh, we need a fairer share. That yes, the Scottish okay, government but have you're to making be. a party political broadcast here uh, at national level. We are here discussing Angus Council, so it should be comments about Angus Council. But the funding comes from the Scottish government. Yes. So my which point is from, that they need to stop in, spending in money on pet projects. Gets, gets by the Barnet formula comes from Westminster. So. That's why, that's why I'm saying we are here to discuss Angus Council's business and how we ba balance the books here. So I'll move on now to number three, Councillor Fairweather. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I thank uh, Mr. Wright, uh, Mr. Lorimer Wright, for the report? Um, uh, this is a reality check, right, but my, by, my goodness, right, right, not half. Uh, I certainly don't envy your job going, for, right, going forward. Um, but going to 6.1, so I'll stick to the report. 88% um, uh, um, not realistic option. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? 88%. Um, it would virtually double right, right, the, the Band D council tax. Perhaps we should maybe look at 88% because that might give a reality check to the Scottish Government right, that we do need more funding. And in fact, we only had to look at the papers and the news this morning um, uh, that, again, it's saying how much underfunding right, we, right, we, right, we've had. Uh, and it's about time that local government, and I'm a local councillor, I'm interested in funding for our local services for my constituents and clearly over the last 10 years, right, we've not had that. And going forward in the next three years, 
it looks like it's going to get even worse. I'll go to 6.2. Um, the financial overview, 2021 Scottish Government funding for local government has fallen in real terms by 4.2%. Nobody can argue with that. That's a fact. So well, there's the reality. That's why we're underfunded. 6.3. The Angus Council Best Value Report. The Angus Council Best Value Audit Report published in July 2022 gives an independent view that the Council does provide best value. Further evidence of the Council's efficiency can be found in the scale of budget savings made since the Council began. I was there for four years of that and I know how difficult right, trying to balance budgets is. I know how difficult it is to find those cuts. But also, in the level of council tax in Angus, which is one of the lowest in Scotland, I was lambasted for that. But I'll tell you what, it was the second lowest in Scotland. But not only was it the second lowest in Scotland, we continued to give the services that the people of Angus deserved. I'm going to go quickly just to 6.9. And Mr Lorimer has already spoken about this. The current mismatch is only going to grow in the period ahead unless there is more funding. Simple. And that funding has to come from the Scottish Government. I'm not interested in Westminster. I'm only interested where we're getting our money from. And our money comes from the Scottish Government. I was one of, thir one of 32 leaders who last year wrote to the Scottish Government through COSLA asking for more funding. I think we asked for something like £100 million. What a mistake that was, because it should have been an awful lot more. And I certainly hope that the leader is going to go back with the other leaders, all the leaders. I'm sure it will be all the leaders, because every council is in the same, right, having the same problems. And ask for a fair settlement, and right, because we need to stop further cuts in the future to our services. Thank you, Councillor Fair. Thank you, sorry, not for interrupting. Thank you, Councillor Fairweather. Um, Councillor Whiteside. Thank you, Thomas. And, um, I was just um, wanting to comment to Mr Lormer and thank him for putting together the support, which makes the finances a little bit easier for some people to understand. And anything that provides more clarity over what's a really difficult situation is very, very welcome indeed. Just in response to some of the other comments, though, I mean, obviously, we're, um, councils in Scotland are, are in a difficult position, which all of us acknowledge, and we'll continue speaking to the Scottish Government through COSLA to, to press the need for more funding. However, the Scottish Government have obviously received a settlement well below inflation from Westminster, and they're in the, exactly the same position. Scottish councils are in a, in a much better position compared to English, English councils in that the ring-fenced funding that has been received goes towards alleviation of poverty. Um, we've seen recent figures that there are 20% fewer people in poverty in Scotland, and that's directly due to the mitigation that's been put in place by the Scottish Government. So if we want to get into politics, um, that's, that's the answer. Um, the, the money starts from Westminster and filters down. I thank uh, Mr Lormer for all the work that he's put into this and we will continue to try and provide the fairest deal for the people of Angus in setting the budget. And I can assure them that we'll not be looking at council tax rises um, in the region of 88%. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor White and Councillor Brace. Yes, thanks, Provost. And thank you, Mr Lormer. Um, I found this really useful. Um, we are all... Uh, elected members are all lay people and uh, it's, it's good to have something so concise and okay concise at what 18 pages but uh, it's very concise compared to what's going to be presented in budget day obviously um, and you know I don't really want to get into all this political arguments about who, who's responsible for the massive reduction in, in uh, council uh, budgets across Scotland over a long period of years. Um, but at the end of the day, the economic levers lie at Westminster. 
and we have a government there who believes in small public sector, low public spending, <coughs> and therefore poor public service. And that's the bottom line here. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Rays. Uh, so, moving on to um, uh, the recommendations A to C are A to note, B, review the analysis in the report and its appendices, and C, note. Is that agreed? Thank you. International Women's Memorial Day and uh, Mark. My, apo my apologies, <laughs> sorry. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I should be. <laughs> International Workers Memorial Day. My apologies, everyone. Thank you, Provost. Good afternoon, councillors. Uh, the report before you formally proposes that Angus Council recognise International Workers Memorial Day. This takes place annually on the 28th of April each year, and it's an international day of remembrance and action for people who have been killed, disabled, injured, or made unwell in the course of their work. The request for this came from Hazard Scotland, who presented at the, the Council's Corporate Health and Safety Working Group uh, at the tail end of last year. And as the report details, uh, work has been done, very significant collaborative work done with all our recognised trade unions to bring this report forward. They, as well as recommending that the Council formally approves the day, the report also recommends that within Angus we establish uh, a formal memorial site uh, recommended to be within Forfar as the main administrative capital or area of the, uh, of the county. And workers are uh, commenced with a group of young people at Forfar Academy supported by uh, the school and the Vibrant Communities team to, to look at a number of options around that. And, uh, and that group of young people are very kind of engaged and, and positive about uh, the potential to be involved with this work. So if the committee approves uh, the formal recognition, the establishment of a memorial, then that, that group will work to, along with the trade unions and council colleagues, to determine a potential site in Forfar and then to consult locally on, on what the most appropriate site would be, but also to actively be involved in uh, designing and possibly even manufacturing uh, both uh, a memorial bench and a tree guard that would, uh, would uh, protect uh, the tree that would, uh, would be located at the same site. So a real opportunity for those young people to be um, very involved in this project and to, uh, to I guess, to, to see it as something that helps raise their awareness and understanding of the importance of health and safety within the workplace when they're really at the kind of early stages of planning their, um, their future work careers. So I, I recommend the, the, the report to you and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Comments? Comments? I saw uh, Councillor Bell's hand up first. Uh, and then I saw um, Councillor Clark was next. I saw. I am getting, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's the first two. I, I'm, I'm getting a shout, Councillor Devine. Oh, the, all the. Well, oh. I mean, uh, no, I am. I, I caught these. Two, these are caught. The, the, naturally, this is the problem of this place, uh, Councillor Devine. And the quicker we get, the quicker we do get back into the, the places, yeah. the better. You can't, it, you know, the, the, the horizon will be halved. But I will, um, I will ensure that you are in at number three, Councillor. Uh, Councillor, there we are. That's because the deputy provost is up at the top, not in the alphabetical. Any further? And Councillor Whiteside. Councillor Whiteside and Councillor Dorn. Hold on, Councillor Whiteside and Councillor Dorn online. Um, any further? No? Okay, I will start with Councillor Bell. Thank you, Provost. Um, I really warmly welcome this proposal and look forward to seeing the the outcome uh, with the, the, the work with the, the school pupils. Um, but I just wanted to say, you know, that we have a lot to be grateful to health and safety developments for. Um, and sadly, it's not a historical um, memorial. There are accidents happening uh, in contemporary times. 
and one of my constituents um, had an accident at work uh, mid-January and sadly died thereafter. So it's a very present um, issue that really raises the profile of um, the importance of health and safety and the fact that you know people go to their work, they don't expect to not return from that and that we need to continue to do all we can to protect people in the workplace, both physically, emotionally and, and mentally. Um, so thank you and I look forward to seeing the outcome. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Provost. Um, and yes, I think most of us would have had uh, people that we know or even relatives. In my case, it was a relative um, back in the days when the Duke Mills um, certainly weren't the place to, to be if you were thinking about health and safety. People lost their, their arms in particular quite regularly and we thought we'd come past that and then we find that fire officers and various other people up to today are still being maimed or losing their lives. That's why it's so important that health and safety, which is often scorned, is not seen to be a laughing matter. Very necessary um, and uh, I, I really warmly endorse this uh, and like my colleagues just said there, it's really good to hear that young people will be involved. That's my background and I really am pleased to see that um, and hear that they'll be involved because they'll, they'll make way, uh, very wise choices. Great to see trade unions there as well, obviously. Um, very, very important. So I'm sure this is something we should all be proud of. Thank you. Councillor Devine. Thanks, Provost. Um, I, I can't add a great deal more to that, but uh, except to say that as a Forfar councillor, I'm delighted that Forfar has been chosen uh, as the place where it's going to be set. Um, and I also look forward to seeing the work that the young people are going to be doing with, along with the trade unions. And I, I'm very glad that the trade unions are, are contributing so much to it as well, uh, financially, I mean, as well as time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Devine. Uh, Councillor uh, uh, Whiteside. <clears throat> Thank you, Provost. I'll keep this brief because much of much has already been said, but I just really um, welcome this. I really like the collaborative approach and the fact that young people are involved in decision making and the fact that we can come together and create a, a meaningful memorial um, at little financial cost, but that's going to be with us for a long time to come. So thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Doran. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll keep this brief as well. It probably won't come as much surprise that I really um, support this and was really pleased to see it um, put forward. And I think the collaboration um, is a really um, strong one to create this, particularly seeing the secondary school pupils involved and the contributions that the trade unions have made to this. So looking forward to seeing what's um, been um, created for the memorial. Thank you, Councillor Dorn, and safe uh, travels home tonight. Thank you. Um, uh, therefore, we're moving on to uh, the recommendations one to four. Our uh, note, the collaborative work that has been undertaken between the Council and the trade, unions in, trade Union in relation to International Workers Memorial Day. Agree to formally recognise International Workers Memorial Day annually on, the, on April 28th agree to the creation and establishment of the IWMD memorial within Angus as detailed within this report and agree finally that if the report recommendations are approved the first uh, International Workers Memorial Day recognition event will take place on the 28th of April 2023 with a memorial bench and tree in place for 2024. Is that agreed? Thank you. Moving on to number eight, His Majesty King Charles III's coronation, 8th of May. Uh, Sharon Falconer. It's on, it's on. <laughs> I didn't see the red light. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon, elected members. Um, this report um, is fairly straightforward. As you can see, it's recommending that the Council considers and approves to grant an additional day of leave for Council employees on Monday the 8th of May 2023, 
in celebration of the King's Coronation Day in line with the Scottish Government setting off a bank holiday. You'll see in section four of the report that education and lifelong learning has applied for and been granted an exemption from the requirement to provide 190 days of schooling in order that all of our schools in Angus can be closed on the 8th of May. Moving on to the financial implications under section six, um, you will see that we're in services where staff um, absences must be covered, um, there are likely to be backfill costs amounting to um, around 50k and those would be spread across different service areas over the course of the year. Um, that's really all I have to say about it but I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Any questions? Comments? Oh, comments from uh, Councillor Proctor. Thanks very much. Uh, Mrs Faulkner for your report and I think is uh, probably one of the few or maybe the only uh, person who remembers the last coronation. Um, <clears throat> I remember it very well, it was primary two or three at the school um, at Webster's uh, and, and I, I remember the occasion, um, you know, we, we actually great affection. Um, 70 years later, um, <clears throat> we're now coming to the coronation of King Charles and, I, and I, the third. And I think we, we all know that the first king of our country, Great Britain, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, was a Scot, James VI um, of Scotland, first of uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And I think it's great that we're actually going to uh, propose and, and hopefully um, support having a holiday uh, on the 8th uh, uh, of May to support this. And um, I uh, just wish uh, our king, King Charles III, a long and happy reign. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Proctor. Um, so, the recommendation is to grant an additional day of leave for council employees on Monday the 8th of May 2023 in celebration of the King's Coronation Day in line with Scottish Government's setting of a bank holiday. Is that agreed? Thank you. And here ends today's meeting. Thank you.